last several weeks to look at the fear of the Lord, and we're going to continue that this morning, looking at uh, the definition, and maybe better, the description of the fear of the Lord. So uh, this morning I hope to just kind of finish our, our a brief study of what the Bible describes as the virtue of the fear of the Lord, and um, we're going to ask the Lord to bless our time together as we get started. So pray with me. Father, we're so thankful for your word, and every, every week that we have been studying the, the fear of you, you know, your word has never failed to give us clarity and, and an answer, and even to increase our fear of you, even as we are just simply studying what it is. And Lord, we are always aware, I pray that, I trust that we are always aware, and we ask that you would make us increasingly aware of the, the very real danger of domesticating you and of thinking about you in, in, in too casual of a way, uh, in a way that would make um, a familiarity with concepts about you uh, that would cause us to uh, imagine that we, we would know you rightly. When, when instead we look at your word and we realize that no matter how familiar we become with a theology or the practice of worship in the church or uh, the ways of what you've called us to do, certain externals by way of worship and action and living. Um, we just pray, Lord, that uh, we, we would live out what a true knowledge of you really is. A true knowledge of you will always be useful and fruitful. A true knowledge of you will always um, resound in greater fear of you and a greater uh, and more intense and refined focus on on living in a way that would really please you. And so, Lord, as we look to your word, I do pray that, again, your word would be powerful. Um, again, we're not asking you to uh, do something that's not true of your word. Your word is always powerful. But we're asking this morning that your all-powerful word would be effectual in our own hearts, effective in our own lives. And that wherever we see um, ways of thinking about you or your word or about ourselves or even about fear itself, if it's unworthy of you, if it's unfaithful to your word, we pray that uh, you would indeed grant great conviction. And I pray that uh, the benefit of this study would not be lost on the hour or lost on a circumstance or lost when we walk out the door. Pray that there would be a real fear. Uh, that we would fear you truly in a way that would permeate how we speak to our children, and how we consider ourselves uh, when we're tired, and how we think about our responsibility to you before your all-seeing eye and before our fellow man. I pray that it would grip us and constrain us and that we would be consumed day in, day out, minute by minute, with the all-consuming focus of what it would look like to please you in everything. And Lord, what we long for is to see a fear of you that would really allow us and produce in us the uh, love for you that would consume our heart, soul, mind, and strength. A fear of you that would compel us to please you in every faculty, in every resource, in every relationship that you've entrusted to us, in every opportunity, with all of our influence, that it would all be for you and for your glory, never for ourselves, and never to impress others with us, but to always to impress others with you. And so, Lord, that's what we're, we desire this morning. We just thank you again for this study, um, how it's refreshed us, how it's compelled us, how it's constrained us, and how it's affected our, our thinking about you. So we ask that you would do that again. Well, I want to just thank you for uh, making Equipping Hour part of your weekly routine. I have enjoyed this study, and um, I can't imagine there's anything more um, practical or relevant than the fear of the Lord, because it touches everything. Fear of the Lord touches everything, and we're going to see that this morning in, in some interesting ways. We're, we're really in the middle of uh, the second uh, part of what we want to study in this um, Fear of the Lord series. Um, several weeks ago, we, we looked at what it means to domesticate God. And that's just kind of a term that I kind of uh, thought would be appropriate to describe what the scriptures warn 
people about, particularly what it warns people about in a religious environment or in a religious context. It's very easy to kind of become familiar with uh, the thought of God or familiar with the word of God or familiar with theology or familiar with the practice of the church or the weekly routine of what happens in the, in the body of the congregation. And the scripture warns that it's very easy to become so familiar with those things that we actually would cease fearing God, and that's kind of what I was describing as the, the domestication of God, uh, where we uh, kind of make him something less than he's not, and we tame him down. And that's why the fear of the Lord is so critical. And in the last study, we started looking at the positive question of what is the fear of the Lord? Uh, what is it really? And, and uh, in some ways, it kind of eludes definition. Uh, but the scriptures do it does it give us a very clear description of the fear of the Lord. So if I can't give you a satisfactory definition of the fear of the Lord, I know the Bible gives you a satisfactory description of the fear of the Lord. And so I want to do a quick review of, of what we looked at. I'm not going to repeat all of those definitions, but if you wanted to go back and listen, a couple weeks ago we looked at some, some very helpful definitions from some authors, uh, contemporary and old. Um, but here's the definition, or maybe better, the description that, that uh, I, I come up with after studying this. The virtuous fear of God involves more than generic fear, but it's not less than an actual fear of God himself. It produces a clinging to God, trembling at his word, an obedience of all his commands, and a love of the one who is feared. The one who fears God is terrorized by the fear of offending God, and consumed with the possibility of pleasing Him. It recognizes intrinsic inability to fear the Lord on His own, and it applies directly to Him for the necessary grace to do so. Simply put, it's a fear that drives a sinner to instinctively cling to God and to tremble at His word, to obey and love Him, and to be consumed with pleasing him. So as I kind of had a little outline that we did in our last study, we started working through the outline of what the fear of God is not, and then we finished that, and we got about halfway through what the fear of the Lord is, I realized, okay, wow, we got, we got a little bit more here. I couldn't, couldn't finish it in an hour, and I just started looking at what was left, and it was just felt like I was dealing with a zip file. You know, when you ever get, you get a little zip file and, and an email, and I don't even know if this thing still exists, but I, I remember a zip file, maybe it's outdated, is it? It's not, I don't know, okay. So, everybody who's old, you know, my age will remember the zip file at least, but it was just a little file that was, you know, encoded to try to have less information, you have to like expand it, you unzip it, and kind of like every stuff goes everywhere, is what I kind of picture in some sort of computer sense of the word. And so I felt like, as I was looking at the outline that was left, and what the Bible describes positively as the fear of the Lord, I just was looking at it, I'm like, oh, we got a little bit more time, we got a whole other week to work through that. And it was like a zip file, just this text just keep coming to mind, this stuff just keeps coming out, and it's just, the Bible is so full and so rich. And so I have to sit there and say, what are we not going to talk about? And that's always the challenge. But to get us back into that outline, what I wanted to do is just give you two texts that explain the tension of why the fear of God is not less than fear, it's a very real fear, but what distinguishes it from the fear that causes a fight or flight response? Why is this fear an actual fear, a very real fear, and not less than a real fear? And then what would not make it like a typical fear? A typical fear causes you to want to fight, to react, or flee, get out of there. It's just, this is not safe, I don't want to be here. So there's this fear that causes you to run away, but this is a very real fear that causes you to cling to God. So if you remember from the domestication of God, we looked at Exodus chapter 20 and verse 20, and I want to, remember, I want to bring that back up here. Um, Exodus 20 verse 20 is a, a great introduction to this concept, because in one verse, Moses gives a prohibition about being afraid and an exhortation to fear. You summarize Exodus 20, verse 20, Moses' command is, don't be afraid, instead, fear. So this is a very real fear, but it's not the kind of being scared that causes you to flee. It's the fear that causes you to cling. And so Exodus 20, verse 20, Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. They're obviously afraid because of the phenomenon. They're afraid 
or physical safety, and they're afraid because they're experiencing something that no man has seen before. And that's startling. But being afraid or being scared is not the virtue. Do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, and in order that the fear of him may remain with you. Don't be scared, don't be afraid, but God is coming so that you can fear him instead. And then the result, if you fear him, would be so that you may not sin. The fear of the Lord is going to keep you from sin, and it's different than this being scared. Now let me show you one that we haven't looked at yet. Let's go to the New Testament for a minute. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 and 29. Uh, the apostle that wrote the book of Hebrews says in verse 28, Hebrews 12, 28, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may, be, we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. And here's a picture of an approach to God. The exhortation is to draw near. Let's draw near with fear. This doesn't cause the fight or flight response. This ought to cause the sinner to go to God to the only source that could provide the grace necessary to actually pull off pleasing Him. To be consumed with the thought of pleasing God would drive us to God to say, God, give me what I don't have because I'm not pleasing you on my own. Give me the grace that I would please you because I'm terrified of offending you and I'm terrified of displeasing you and I want to be in that position of a relationship forgiven, honorable to your will. That's where I want to live. And so the exhortation is, let's try it. It's funny because when you think about this fear of God, it's just challenging to get our minds around at times because it really is unlike any other fear. The only other fear, uh, as I mentioned last week, that's maybe even close it, it, by way of how we think about it would be the fear of man. It's the categorical opposite. It means being consumed with what people think of us. The fear of God is being consumed with what God thinks of us. But I thought about it, and I thought, is there, is there any natural fear, any natural experience that could even come close to explaining this tension between not being scared, but then actually, uh, you know, not being safe, or but, you know, having a real fear, but not being scared in a way that would drive me away, but to leave me clinging to God. And, and the, the only, this is, my, this is my best attempt, and it's a very poor attempt, but I'm going to share it nonetheless. Just, so, just for your entertainment this morning. I remember on our first uh, anniversary, April and I went um, hiking in Yosemite, and uh, we got a... We got a pass to hike up in the, the northern wilderness area, and we, we hiked in through this wilderness area that, that ends at the northern rim of the valley. And so we, we camped about two miles from Yosemite Falls. And if you've ever been to Yosemite, you remember from the, in the valley there, um, if you're looking at the north rim, there's El Capitan, and then farther over to the right, Yosemite Falls. And it's just a massive, gorgeous um, set of waterfalls. It's, it's, it's one waterfall in a sense, but it's, it's broken about two, two times, so there's three sections of the waterfall, all told in about, you know, 10 feet on the map, water is falling uh, 2,400 feet. And so we hiked and we set up our camp, we left our gear in the woods, and then we finished the hike all the way out to the, to the rim. And I remember getting to uh, the, the, the northern rim of Yosemite and um, you know, you get about, you get a couple hundred yards from the edge and you, you're, you're, you're looking at all of the phenomena on the south side of the rim. You're looking at Half Dome, you're looking at Bridal Veil Falls, and it's just, it's just gorgeous. And you can see these things all the way across, you know, um, whatever that is, a mile across on the other side there. And then as you get closer and closer, you get about 100 feet, you start to see the, the face of Half Dome. And then you, see you, get, a, you get about 20 feet as you, and you're watching, you're watching the valley floor unfold in front of you. And as you're, as you're thinking about these angles, it just starts to get more and more and more impressive. And so we hiked down, you know, a couple of, like, there's some kind of, like, stone, stone steps there. And at the very edge, there was just, like, this, you know, seemed to me a kind of cheap piece of metal pipe and a little chain, a little dinky chain. I'm not even sure if it would have held my weight. Just, that's all it is, separating me 
from the cliff going off on the other side. And I didn't trust that chain, but I wanted to look. And so I got down on my, like a man, I got down on my face. I am so scared. And I just crawl over toward the edge, you know, like a little girl. And I'm just like, oh, my goodness, what am I looking at? No offense, little girl. <laughs> and so I crawl over to the edge, and I start looking down, and, it's, and it's, the valley floor is opening, and it's like all of a sudden I can see the, the parking lot and the, and the temporary camping site, and then I can see the roads, and I can see traffic driving, and then I can see Yosemite Village, which is probably uh, just a couple hundred yards from the cliff, and then I do it. I stick, I have enough, I have enough nerve. I think the weight of my eyeball is not going to catapult me off of this ledge. I'm just going to lean it over the edge, and I'm peek over the edge, and I'm looking straight down a half mile at the valley floor below me. And as I'm sitting there on that ledge and looking down, the view was just terrifying. But it wasn't the kind of terror that makes me want to leave. I just was so impressed. Like, this is, I am not safe at all, but this is amazing. And there's something about knowing the living God who is a consuming fire. It's never safe, but it's always terrifying and amazing. It doesn't drive you away. When you see God with the eyes of faith, it is terrifying and amazing. And that's what's so sweet about the fear of the Lord. It's what makes it so distinct from any other fear. So let me just go back and let me just repeat. I'm not going to fill in the details here, but just repeat the outline to get, to get back where we left off last time. Fear of God. What it is not, what it is not, we looked at about five things that the fear of God is not. It's not mere respect. It's not being afraid or scared. It's not a short-lived fear. It's not a fight-or-flight response. And it is not a fear of punishment. Perfect love casts out that kind of fear. But what is it? What is the fear of the Lord? And this is where the Bible is so helpful because it says on the positive side that the fear of God is it's the very basis for a relationship with God. And we looked at this last time. Um, it, it is possible because of forgiveness. The only way we could fear God is because there is forgiveness with God. If there were no forgiveness with God, we could not have a right relationship with him. The virtuous fear of the Lord would be impossible if there was no forgiveness. All we would be left with is the fear of punishment. But because there is forgiveness with God, we can actually fear him. We can actually walk in a relationship um, that, that, that pleases him and honors him in the way that he deserves. We also saw how, on the positive side, you can see what it is by, by contrasting it with the fear of man. The fear of the Lord is seeking to please God and not man. Seeking to honor God and not man. It's a consuming focus that the, determines the actions and directions of your life. Just like being enslaved to the fear of man would, on the opposite side, direct the course and the actions of your life in the opposite direction. We also saw that the fear of God is actually God's name. It's actually God's name. We, we talk about the, the names of God. Um, so far as I know, like if I've seen a t-shirt or a, or a, or a poster or a uh, or even in an article about the names of God, I don't know that I've seen a lot of discussion about the name of the Lord being fear. But in Genesis 31, verse 42, and Genesis 31, 53, that's actually the name of the Lord, the fear of Jacob. He calls God the fear of Jacob. The fear of God also is synonymous with love and obedience. And we looked at Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12 says... Um, it makes the two commandments, love God and, and um, fear God, as synonyms. In fact, it, it lists out several commands, namely, walk, love, serve, keep, and fear. So walking in the ways of God, serving God, keeping his commandments, loving God, and fearing God are, uh, you might be, we might be able to say we can distinguish them, but we cannot separate them. We cannot separate them. And so Moses utters those as synonyms. Um, in Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. Now, 
We've got a couple more, and we're only going to have, there's only two more, and they're going to take all of our time this morning. The last two, uh, the last one really is going to take a ton of time. This, this second to last one is, is a little bit quicker. The Bible also says that the fear of the Lord is the cause of all true happiness. It's the cause of all true happiness. Um, there is no true joy, and there is no true satisfaction, and there is no true happiness, and there is no true satisfaction for the soul of man apart from fearing God. Let's start in Psalm 112. Psalm 112. And this is so helpful. Uh, we'll look at a couple of psalms, and then I'll make an allusion to Ecclesiastes, but we'll be quick here. Psalm 112, verse 1. Praise the Lord. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. You might be familiar with phrases like that. You might think of Psalm 1. You might think of Matthew 5. You might think of the statements. There's so many, so many profound statements about blessedness. Spiritually fortunate. Happy, not in a secular sense. Happy is a great word. It's just, unfortunately, it's too glib and superficial to account for the robust definition of blessedness in the scripture. But if it wasn't abused in the typical usage, happiness would be a great word for the word blessedness um, in Psalm 1 and Psalm 112. But, so this becomes such a common phrase. You, almost, you can probably read this verse and almost just skip over it. But when you pause and think about it, verse 1 makes an equal sign between spiritual happiness and fearing the Lord. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord. The man who fears the Lord is happy, blessed, spiritually fortunate. He has all that he needs for joy and satisfaction. This man is immune to the dissatisfaction that would come to the man who finds his joy in circumstance. Because no matter what circumstance he could possibly find himself in. There is not a single circumstance on the face of this planet that require him to be displeasing to his God. His happiness comes from fearing God. Similarly, let's look real quick at Psalm 128. Turn over a few pages to Psalm 128, this famous psalm about the blessing of family and raising children in a way that would please him. Look at Psalm 128, verse 1. How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. So if a, syn if a, if a synonym for fearing the Lord is delighting in his commandments from Psalm 118, here in 128, I'm sorry, in Psalm 112, here in 1, 128, how blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, comma, who walks in his ways. Walking in the ways of God is part of fearing the Lord. And the guy who fears the Lord, slash, walks in his ways, is blessed. How, and he, he says it in, how blessed? How blessed? I mean, it's just, it's a statement. It's, this guy is so blessed as to be beyond degree. How blessed? And if you ask it as a question like, well, how blessed is he? <laughs> it's beyond answering. It's a statement of fact. How blessed he really is. He is so blessed. He's so happy. Verse 4. For behold, for thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. And it talks about his influence. The influence of the man who fears the Lord on his wife and on his children. And um, the benefit that that is for another generation to fear the Lord. In a Psalm 78 type of sense. Psalm 128 can go with Psalm 78 about what it means to produce a generation that fears the Lord. And here he's describing it in the level of the, in, of the, of the family. It's the cause of all true happiness. And I won't make you turn there, but I would encourage you to consider how the fear of the Lord is the cause of all true happiness from the sermon called Ecclesiastes. Solomon preached one of the greatest sermons ever preached in the book of Ecclesiastes, and in four 
sections from one, chapters 1 to 3, 4 to 6, 7 to 9, 8, 9 to 12. He has a sermon that explains where in the world can man go to find joy and satisfaction under the sun? And not just man in general. B'nai ha'adam. The Hebrew is very specific. It means sons of the Adam. The typical Hebrew way to say that would be sons of man, just without the definite article. And Solomon's preaching a sermon about the descendants of the Adam who fell. And here we are in a cursed world and a cursed earth. And so let's just ask the question, where does man go to find joy and satisfaction? And let's limit our search to everything under the sun. That'll be the limit of our search. The answer to that question, where a man who is a descendant of the fallen Adam, who lives in a cursed earth, and he limits his search to everything under the sun, the answer to that, that's a vain search, my friends. And Solomon is sitting there, and I just picture him at the end of his life with all of the wisdom of decades of compromise, but yet nevertheless being a faithful Old Testament saint. And it's just he's got his bony finger out, probably not speaking to Rehoboam now, probably speaking to his grandkids. And they probably heard it as, you know, grandpa saying, oh, when I was a kid. But what he's saying is so timeless. He's saying, listen to me. Do not squander your life. Pursuing happiness by looking under the sun. I pursued all of it. And by the way, I had more resources to pursue all of it than any of you, Solomon would have said. And so if anybody was a candidate to preach this sermon, it would be Solomon. And he says, here's the verdict on this whole deal. Fear God. The punch of Ecclesiastes is there is... Nothing that can satisfy man's soul when you limit your search to what's under the sun. This is a cursed creation. It's broken on purpose, and it's hardwired with curse to cause worshipers to look outside of this cursed earth to look to God. Fear God. It's the only source of happiness. Where we're going to spend the rest of our time is where the Bible spends so much time when it comes to the fear of God, and this will be no surprise to anyone in the room. What is the fear of God? It's the cause of all wisdom and discernment. The fear of God is the cause of all wisdom and discernment. Take your Bibles and open up to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. That's how it begins. And the prologue goes from chapter 1-1 to 1-7. And it's just simply describing what you have here in the book of Proverbs. And the way that he describes the Proverbs is he describes them by their purpose. It's so fascinating. You ever ever notice that? Okay, the Proverbs of Solomon. And then it doesn't go on with a complete sentence. It just says the Proverbs of Solomon. In order to. (laughs) And the purpose of the Proverbs are 1b all the way through 7. So skipping verses 2 through 6, not because they're unimportant but because they are so important, but verse 7 is where it gets to the fear of the Lord. Verse 7 finally summarizes all of those purpose statements from, two, uh, from 1b to, to 6. Verse 7 summarizes this way. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is where it all starts. It's the beginning of knowledge. Now, as you know, skip over to chapter 9, verse 10. This kind of becomes a bookend of these, um, of these uh, thematic proverbs before he gets to some of the more ad hoc proverbs of chapters 10 through to 29. Um, in chapter 9, verse 10, Solomon says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. To truly know the Holy God is understanding. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So he repeats the same line in the first phrase. The second phrase is unique. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. You know the God who is unlike anything or anyone else, totally set apart, totally distinct, totally sacred, consecrated, distinct from other gods, distinct from his creation, distinct from anything we could possibly conjure up in our minds. To know that God who is holy That's understanding. And to fear him, that's the foundation, the beginning, the launch point of all 
wisdom. Briefly look at Psalm 110. I'm sorry, Psalm 111. Psalm 111, we have the same, same phrase. Psalm 111, verse 10, the last verse of Psalm 111. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Notice that it does not say, none of these three verses, Proverbs 1-7, Proverbs 9-10, Psalm 111, verse 10, none of these verses say, knowing things about God is the beginning of wisdom. You can know a lot about God and have no wisdom. Notice that it doesn't say, a good understanding have all those who know his commandments. Think about how beneficial that is to consider the contrast. It does not say, a good understanding have all those who know his commandments. It says, a good understanding have all of those who do his commandments. See, we're not talking here about intellect. We're not talking about knowledge. We're talking about a skill of living wisely. So, the fear of the Lord is the source of all wisdom and discernment. So, you know, even, even uh, younger kids, think about it this way. When you think, young kids, think about this. When you think about what does it mean to fear the Lord and, and it produces wisdom, don't think fear of the Lord produces, makes you smart. As if the fear of the Lord, suddenly you start getting 4.0s. Okay? Think about it this way. Fearing the Lord produces skill. Ability. Ability to do what? As these verses say, to avoid evil. The skill of living a life that is not useless nor unfruitful. It's a skill that allows you to walk through life avoiding the pitfalls and the snares and the hindrances of circumstances that would be displeasing to the Lord. And it en enables you to walk wisely so that your heart is gripped by pleasing God in your inner man, and the outflow of your life is going to be incredibly wise. You're going to be wiser than all your friends. You're going to be wiser than all of your teachers. You're going to be wiser than people younger than you, older than you. As Psalm 119 says, he has more wisdom than his teachers because his law was his delight. Because I've obeyed your commands. Obedience is what produces this kind of wisdom. It's, it's a wisdom that is an ability and a skill, and it's fruitful. It's not, a, it's not a knowledge. It's not intellect. It's not data that goes nowhere. In our, in our tech world, we have so much raw process, processing power. Um, I have a phone in my pocket that holds 25 times more data than the laptop that I went through seminary with. With language tools and all and papers and doing research, and it is 25 times the size of my laptop, not physically, but by way of data that it holds. It's profound. And if I knew more about tech, I could probably impress you with some sort of like processing speed and power of my phone. I don't even know what it is, and I couldn't even, you know, do an illustration like that without distracting you, so I won't try. But what impressed me is the difference between the ability to process the, the, the ability to process versus the ability to store data. I have this phone; it's, it's pretty new. And uh, Brian Eiserman, good friend of mine here from my small group, he sets me up for our small group on the uh, Anderson Men's Small Group. So I get a link and invite to join GroupMe. So I download GroupMe and I've got GroupMe on my phone. I click his link. It takes me over to GroupMe and it says, do you want to join Anderson Men's Small Group? Yes. Eh. Screens comes up. It says, something went wrong. Please try again. So I obediently tried again. Went back to, the, to Brian's text, clicked on it. He said, do you want to join? I said, yes. Eh. Something went wrong. Please try again. So I diligently tried again and again and again. And then I texted Brian, it's not working. 
He said, oh, troubleshoot this. So I went and did some notifications and some other things, and I felt really savvy and went into the preferences, and wow, this preference is cool. And so I changed this all around, and then I tried again. Hit the button. Do you want to join? Yes. <coughs> Something went wrong. Please try again. That was three weeks ago. And um, as I was writing these notes, I realized, oh, I want to make sure I get the wording right. So I went, clicked on Brian's text, could hit the button. It took me to group me and said, do you want to join Anderson Men's Small Group? I said, yes. <coughs> Something went wrong. Please try again. And just for sheer enjoyment, I did it one more time. And it said, something went wrong. Please try again. The ability of a computer to hold massive amounts of information, but to not actually carry out the function, would be akin to having knowledge about God but not fearing him. It would be akin to memorizing his commandments, but not doing them. It would be like taking the intellect of, a, of an Einstein, or a Heisenberg, a von Mises, a Bertrand Russell, a Rousseau. You take the intellect of those men, you put them all into one mind, and you leave it without fear of the Lord. And that's what you get. Tremendous intellect, no wisdom, no skill, no ability to live a life pleasing to God. Why is it that the course of someone's life without the fear of the Lord is so predictable? I mentioned this last time. Uh, you young kids, you think, about, you think about what happens when you grow older and you don't deal with sin and you think, wow, that's crazy. How did that life get there? I was asking myself that when I read Paul Johnson's book, The Intellectuals, and read the story of Bertrand Russell. I mean, I'd, I'd read his stuff on why I'm not a Christian, his philosophical critiques of Christianity, which were laughable. But reading his biography was just tragic. You think, kids, why is it so predictable? If you don't fear the Lord now, I can tell you exactly where your life's going to go. Because Psalm 36 is still true. Turn and look at Psalm 36 for a second, because this is a psalm that shows the skill and the ability. This is, this is really a theological explanation for why the fear of the Lord is the foundation of all wisdom. This is the, this is the reason why uh, you, you have to fear God in order to have practical skill to please Him. Psalm 36, verse 1 Transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. Okay, and so this is a, this is a passage I go to all the time. Um, it doesn't matter if it's for my own heart. It doesn't matter if I'm trying to help someone else. This is just universally applicable to all of our hearts. Psalm 36, verse 1. When transgression is doing the talking, suddenly we know that David has personified transgression. Transgression itself is now personified as an entity, and it's whispering and it's, it's, you know, it's almost like you picture those old cartoons with the angel and the demon on each shoulder, and it's like counteractive advice. Well, now you've got transgression, and it's personified speaking in the heart. So the ungodly person has transgression. Transgression's monologuing. It's whispering, and he's listening. It's like, hey, listen up. And the ungodly's like, yeah, what are you, you going to tell me? Verse 1b, there's no fear of God before his eyes. There's no fear of God before his eyes. Why is there no fear of God before his eyes? Verse 2, because it flatters him in his own eyes. What's doing the flattering? Transgression. Transgression is talking to him. And what does transgression do? Transgression flatters. That is its nature. Sin will flatter you. It'll flatter you by telling you all sorts of sweet nothings. Literally, sweet nothings. They're tantalizing to your ear because you want them to be true, you want to believe them, and it whispers in your ear, and you start to believe it because it's flattering, and you like to think inflated thoughts about yourself. And to the ungodly person who thinks inflated thoughts about themselves, transgression is ready to write a check, a blank check, on that sinful, idolatrous motive. Oh, this guy likes to think big thoughts about himself. Let's tell him big things about himself. And the guy says, what did you say? I believe it. Transgression starts to flatter the sinner. Hey, you know, you know how to get out of this situation. You can still get what you want, and you can still avoid the consequences. Or 
you know, you're, you're savvy. You know how to pursue this sin and then not have the complications involved or avoid the consequence. It starts to flatter you about your own ability. It flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. Notice there's two areas where it starts to flatter. It starts to flatter you in regards to the discovery of iniquity. You, it'll tell you, you'll be able to recognize sin. You, you'll be able to recognize sin. You can navigate this path. You don't have to listen to all these commands of the Lord. You don't have to heed all of these warnings. You can start down that path. You'll still be able to discern right from wrong. When God says, you go down that path, you can't discern right from wrong. It'll ruin your ability to discern. And it even flatters you concerning the hatred of it. Why is it that when we're in our sin, we'll still be convinced that we hate our sin? Because transgression flatters. Transgression flatters the sinner so that we can no longer actually discover the iniquity or no longer actually hate sin. Verse 3, the words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He ceased to be wise and do good. He plans wickedness upon his bed. He sets himself on a path that is not good. He does not despise evil. Notice where this lies. This is all happening in the heart. Verse 1, it happens within his heart. Verse 4, it doesn't say he performs the wicked plans. It doesn't say that um, um, he performs evil. It says he plans wickedness upon his bed. He sets himself on a path that is not good. He does not despise evil. He's losing the battle in the inner man. And he's actually, and whether he acts on the plans or not, he's planning what he wants. And the inner monologue, when he's tired and he's coming up with schemes and plans and his ultimate desires are on display, whether he acts on them or not, that's what's captured his heart. That's exactly why the course of one's life is so predictable without the fear of the Lord. The only change, the only cause of change, the only means of change is God's grace. Listen, when it comes to the ability to live a life that pleases the Lord, when it comes to putting a smile on God's face, when it comes to um, obeying the Lord and honoring Him, we need to think soberly and seriously about what we bring to the table in that endeavor. What do we bring to the table when it comes to wisdom, practical wisdom, ability, and skill? You have a natural intellect. You might be able to use it, and you might be able to analyze arguments from, from a long ways away, and you might be able to recognize patterns in, in, um, with, in data or in people's lives. It doesn't matter. You might have a profound ability of intellect to be able to handle information. It's totally different than wisdom and discernment. You might have a relational IQ. You might be able to read people. You might be able to know intuitively their concerns. You might be able to know intuitively their, their burdens and their challenges and other relationships. You might have incredible ability to serve in the church. You might have incredible gifts of hospitality. You might have incredible gifts of leadership. You might be able to uh, make people feel right at home in your house. You might be able to um, uh, motivate and encourage and equip people. You might have incredible gifts of compassion and mercy. You, we could go through all of the lists of what God gives to the church through gifted individuals. And you might think, I have some natural abilities in those categories. And all of that is a nothing when it comes to living a life that is pleasing to the Lord or the skill of wisdom if you don't have the fear of God. The fear of God is everything. If you don't fear God, you cannot walk wisely. Without the fear of God, you will not have wisdom or discernment. And whatever gifting or resources you have, you won't be able to please the Lord with them. The scriptures are so help helpful when they point us to the value of the fear of the Lord. And I want to I direct your attention to Job 28, and we'll end with this. Job 28. In the middle of the dialogue between... Um, Job and his friends. Verse 
is this monologue where Job starts talking about the value of the fear of the Lord and the value of wisdom. As he's talking, you know, remember Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar, they're, they're coming at Job with kind of um, various forms of um, what might be considered some sort of merit theology, some form of type of a theological version of uh, karma, where, you know, these things wouldn't be happening to you, Job, if you hadn't mistreated God in some way, and which, was, which was not true. They're coming to him with lies, but he's already, got, he's already crossed the line several times in his defense, basically saying, because I didn't do anything to deserve this, God owes me an answer. And he's clearly started to sin against the Lord. And in chapter 28, he starts telling his friends, and this is appropriate, he starts telling his friend, look, how valuable in this conversation is wisdom? We need wisdom. And in verses 1 through 11, he starts comparing he starts describing how men will work so insanely hard to pull silver and gold and precious rocks out of the earth. And he describes the surely there's a mine for silver, a place where they refine gold. Verse 3, man puts an end to darkness to the farthest limit. He searches out the rock in gloom and deep shadow. He sinks a shaft far from habitation, forgotten by the foot. They hang and swing to and, far, and fro far from men. And as I read that, I, I'm, I'm reminded of being in a, in a gold mine. I took Micah one time to a gold mine in Colorado and we, were, we went a mile below the, the surface of the earth and when we got down in some of these chasms that were active back in the 1800s, they were describing how they would have one big main shaft and they would send out tentacles going certain directions every hundred feet because then if they, if they went too close together, you would ruin the integrity of the rock and you could have people get, you know, getting caved in and get people, you know, rocks falling on you from below. So they'd have a hundred foot gap and it was just like this maze where they'd send out shafts this way, 200 feet, send them out this way, 300 feet, send them out this way. And if they found a gold vein, they would cease all other drilling and then just start going wherever that gold vein went in all sorts of awkward directions. And it was just like mapping out these tentacles, like, a, like creating a spider web through rock, trying to find more gold. It's just that valuable. But you skip down to verse 12, and after describing how, how much work he'll go to, man will go to that kind of work, even damming up rivers so that water doesn't flood the mine shaft and it keeps you of, from getting the, the valuable gold that's down there. He says in verse 12, but where can wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value, nor is it found in the living, in the, excuse me, in the land of the living. The deep says it's not in me. The sea says it's not with me. Pure gold can't be given in exchange for it, nor can silver be weighed as its price. It can't be valued in the gold of Ophir and the precious onyx or sapphire. Gold or glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for articles of fine gold. I mean, this is, it, it would be worth giving up all the wealth of the entire planet to get wisdom. It's that valuable. Skip down to verse 23. Here we, here's the answer. Where can you find wisdom? God understands its way. And he knows its place. He looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. If you want wisdom and you want knowledge, you have to go to the source of the one who knows all and sees all. When he imparted weight to the wind and meted out the waters by the measure, when he set a limit for the rain and a course for the thunderbolt, then he saw it and declared he established it and also searched it out. And to man he said, Behold, after, after 27 verses, where in the world can you find wisdom? Look, here's your answer. Look at this. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. You can't find it on this planet. Wisdom and discernment are only found in the fear of the Lord. If you are not concerned about offending God, you know what happens? We get stupid, to put it in the vernacular. Sin makes you stupid. The only source of wisdom and discernment is fearing God. Being gripped with the terror of, I could offend him. And being consumed with the thrill of, I could please him. That's the foundation for wisdom. Simply put, the fear of God is a fear that drives a sinner to 
instinctively cling to God, to tremble at his word, to obey and love him, and to be consumed with pleasing him. That's what the Bible says is the fear of God. Well, next week we're going to, Lord willing, examine what the Bible says about where, where fear comes from or how we get it. We're going to learn, I'm just going to give you an, uh, uh, a heads up, we're going to learn the Bible says that the fear of God is not static, it's not uh, genetic, it's not something that you inherit, it's not an innate ability, it's something that is birthed and developed and grown and deepened and strengthened through your relationship with God's word. God's word is the only means for gaining and growing in your fear of the Lord. And that's what we're going to look at next week. Father, we're so thankful for your word. And again, we're just so thankful for this study. Um, Lord, I, I'm very aware after looking at some of these texts that um, I have much, much room to grow. I do not fear you as I ought. I'm telling you something that you know better than I do, but it's so important to confess that so that I might grow in the fear of you. And I pray that that's our prayer as a church this morning. As a body, I pray that we would grow in the fear of you. Now for some, that might just be the, might, might show up in some really um, great fruit regarding thick skin, regarding what people think of them. For others, it might show up in some great fruit regarding uh, some in more intense sobriety about the liability that we naturally bring to your church or to your gospel. But for all of us, Lord, regardless of how it might manifest itself, we all know and we all confess as a church, we want to confess before you that we need to fear you more. Thank you for giving us such a clear description of what it means to fear you. And I pray that as we continue this study, we would grow in our fear of you, that our fear would become more, more deep, more profound, more convinced, more pervasive, all-consuming, and that you would flesh out in our hearts a consuming fear of you so that we would come to you with reverential awe because you are indeed a consuming fire. Thank you so much for telling us this so that we can have a right relationship with you. Thank you for revealing your forgiveness so that we could have a potential to fear you in the virtuous way. Um, Lord, that's our desire. Help us to walk in a way that pleases you. In your name I pray.